On today's show, we talk to a woman who has to put her mom in a long-term care facility, and she is struggling. We also talk to another mom whose 16-year-old daughter attempted suicide, and the whole family is struggling. And we talk about some listener feedback to one of my last calls. Stay tuned. Hey, what's up? What's up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. We're so glad you're with us. We're talking about relationships and mental health and school and education and hospitals and all of it. We have a fascinating show today ahead of you. Um, Can't wait to get into this. Kelly, listen, uh, before we get going, I got a parenting call from John in Nashville, and he needs some help. So, (laughs) I don't even... I don't even know what to say about this. So the other morning, I walked in after being Johnny Exercise, and my daughter was in there at early in the morning. And by the way, anyone who starts a sentence like I just did is an idiot. It's such a ridiculous flex that I don't mean to do it like that. I'm just trying to be honest. So it was sweaty and gross. But I walked in, and I kissed my daughter on top of the head and said, good morning. I love you. To which she replied... Ugh, I wish you would cease to exist. (laughs) I was like, number one, no more Harry Potter for you. That's a lot. And my wife, she jumped in. She's like, that was rude and ugly. I didn't know what to say to that. None of that was in my grad school classes. Like, what did, when your five-year-old says, I wish you were dead. I don't know what to say. And then I asked her, why did you say that? And again, you're not supposed to ever ask the word why. And she said... Because you always just kiss me and tell me that you love me, and I'm sick of it. (laughs) Kelly, from John in Nashville, what what do I do with that? Usually that doesn't happen for like another eight, ten years. Oh, we are way up up there. Yeah, you've got a long road. She also was smoking at the time, and she was like— had a bourbon in one hand. bourbon number three. That's right. That's right. Um, Usually because I'm a bit of a sarcastic person, um, my response is, well, tough— have I have I told you the uh, the sarcasm thing about uh, I was I was at a counseling conference I think this was like at Harvard I was somewhere fancy and they were talking to us as though we knew these things and as a new parent I was just nodding along but I had no idea what they were talking about and they said oh you know that kids can't process sarcasm until the age of seven to which I was like I need you to say that again say what because about eighty eight percent not eighty that was a lie ninety eight percent of the words spoken in my home. We're just sarcasm. And they said, kids will nod and smile and agree with you. But until they're seven or eight or nine, they just download that as fact. And I just thought, oh, no. Oh, no. So we've tried to change that with my my son, Lost Cause. But I've tried to change that with my daughter. But she's hoping. The first time one of your kids comes back with a sarcastic remark, though. Uh, yeah. Oh, it my just, son's getting good. Isn't it, it makes, great? I know. It makes my heart feel a little bit, a little bit bigger. I'm like, hey, you can never, ever say that, but that was awesome. Yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. It's good. I love it. I love it. So um, she hugged me today, so that feels like a win. I you can't take anything kids say to heart. I know, and I tell everybody that for a living. But I when know. your kid says, I wish you would cease to exist, <laughs> it just feels like a lot. So I patronus her. I don't know what they do in Harry Potter. Is that what you do? You Patronus? No. I patron- no. That's right. No. It is right, Ben? Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah, how you like them apples, Kelly? Hmm. All right, hey, so I want to start today with this email that Kelly forwarded me. So thanks for um, dayruiner.com.net, Kelly. But this is actually serious, and I remembered this, and um, yes, I just want to put this out there. So here's the email. Um, I listened to your show this morning on um, Monday, August 30th, which means we probably filmed this sometime in July, Uh, maybe early, early August. I had tears in my eyes for the woman who had to listen to her child tell her how father was basically verbally abusing him on his own time. And uh, I was dismayed to hear you, me, tell her to get a lawyer and fight him in court. Your other advice, such as telling him that he isn't stupid and getting him a therapist and all that stuff were spot on. However, I was sad to hear that people actually believe the court system is going to do anything about a father yelling at his child. And then she goes on to tell me about some context in her situation. Her child is autistic, ADHD, epileptic, has various other struggles. And she spent five years trying to convince him that um, her ex, that kids shouldn't stay up all night. Um, They should 
have to take their seizure medications. And um, dad just doesn't get to decide, you know what, I think medications are bullcrap. I'm not giving them to them. Um, they shouldn't be giving them at two or three in the morning whenever they forget and have to wake up a kid. And anyway, she goes on to say, we've had a long drawn out fight that when he doesn't take his meds and all those kind of things, um, it's a mess. It's, she's called CPS, called APS, and even worked with a lawyer. And she goes on to say, nobody cares besides me. The court system will not remove kids even from a physically abusive situation. Sometimes CPS will, Child Protective Services, whatever they are in your state. But that's a crapshoot. Anyway, all this to say, my experience is that family court is a sad, horrible place that often the best interest of the children is not actually what happens. I could give you many of my friends whose children have been totally left aside by the court system and given back to abusive parents. All that I'm saying is please be gentle. Please, please be gentle on us moms who have to go through this nightmare of an abusive ex-husband or even dads with an abusive ex-wife. Any amount of hope that this can actually change can be detrimental. So, one, thank you so much for writing in. Um, it means the world that you took time to write about your experience. And this is one of the rare shows that I left and I was sick to my stomach all the way home. Because she's right. Now, I've worked closely with family lawyers. They're awesome. They try so hard. I've worked really closely with family court-appointed lawyers. They are incredible. The work they do is incredible. Who they are is incredible. What they're, what they're doing in the world is incredible. <sighs> and it's a mess. And occasionally on this show, I get calls that um, there's not a great answer to. It's a matter of what sucks less, or it's a matter of, yeah, this is the situation you're in. You've got a husband who, or an ex-husband who's not a good person. They, they're terrible. They suck, and they're taking all of their world's crap out on a 9-year-old, an 11-year-old, and it's heartbreaking. And in those kind of moments on this show, I can say, hey, I mean, you can go get a lawyer and try to fight this, and you might find the right judge, the right lawyer— um, your ex-husband may not show up to court. He may say something stupid. He may say, you know what? I don't even want custody anymore. And that's what we're aiming for in those situations. But also there's a reality to this. And I've heard this over and over too, that um, sometimes there's not a lot you can do. And for those folks who are dealing with a crappy ex, I'm sorry. It's hard. It hurts. You're playing a long game with your kid. And you're not only combating negative stuff, you're not, uh, you're not living while your child's being traumatized by somebody who forgets to give them their medications for seizures and, oh, oh yeah, and wakes up four beers in, wakes them up at 3 a.m. is like, hey, you got to take your meds. Doesn't get them to school on time, doesn't make sure they're bathing, doesn't, calls them stupid, says you're an idiot, says in this house we make free throws, that kind of nonsense. I'm so sorry. Um, you're playing a long game with your kid and you're not going to be able to speak that out of them. You're going to have to love that out of them. You're going to have to show them over time and over time and over time. And you're going to want to say bad things about their dad, bad things about their mom. And I'm going to continue to double down and say don't do that. But it's hard. And if you are an ex and that's you, stop, 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 stop. Kids need routine. They need their medication, whether you read some internet article or not. They need you to show up to school events. They need you to get over the, like, your petty differences between your ex and y'all show up together. Be grown-ups for your kids. Don't beat up your kids. Don't scream at your kids. Don't call your kids stupid. And if you find yourself doing that, stop. And if you can't stop, go get some help and quit because you're, you're creating generational drama. I had to deal with it too. Stop. You especially know how much this hurts. And I don't like my tax dollars having to go to support these attorneys and these, these judges because you can't parent. Because you're a jerk, because you take out crap. I forgot, dude, I forgot my video games. The game was a, shut up and fix it. Stop, these are kids, kids. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't. I didn't let this this author know I was going to read this email. Thank you for writing in. And hey, anytime I say something on the show that you're like, man, I don't really think that's right, or I haven't had that experience, or I appreciate that, but man, my experience is different. Please write in. 
And if you are found yourself in a situation where you are uh, a spouse, an ex-spouse, and you're not treating your kids right, today's the day that you change. Today's the day you change. We'll be right back on the Dr. John Deloy Show. You always hear me talking about how good deep sleep impacts your anxiety, your depression, your attitude, your mental health, your physical health, your work performance. Sleep is critical to every single thing in your life. And if you want to change the way you sleep, you first start with a world-class mattress, one that you can actually afford. And you know I only recommend things that me and my family use in our home, and that's why I partnered with Dream Cloud Mattress. Dream Cloud gives you premium, world-class materials in a mattress at half the price. They utilize innovative sleep science to build mattresses that keep you cool, that support you in any position, and it adapts to your body. I made sure they have price points for every budget. Dream Cloud is for you. They are currently running their biggest offer ever. A total of 650 bucks in bedding and cash savings exclusive for Dr. John Deloney show listeners. They also have a 365 day home trial. Sleep on it for a year. And if you don't like it, send it back. Visit dreamcloudsleep.com slash Deloney. Get $650 in savings and goodies and start sleeping today. All right, we're back. Let's go to Alexis in Philadelphia, where I was born and raised. Not really. That was just a Will Smith reference. How are you, Alexis? Hey, Dr. John. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. Thanks for calling. What's up? How can I help? Okay, so I have a unique one for you. It's a little long-winded, so just bear with me. Um, my mother recently suffered her second stroke in three years this uh, past June. Uh, I'm so uh, in sorry. Addition, thank you. Um, in addition to other major accidents, such as falls, a hip replacement, and things of that nature, um, the second stroke has seemed to impair her cognitive function in terms of decision making, short term memory, and insight across, uh, according to her medical discharge. But it's also evident that over the course of these last few months since her stroke, that my mom seems to be using this, I want to say in air quotes, impairment as a tool to manipulate multiple situations in her life. And one of the situations that she's manipulating right now is her long term care plan such as the in-home nursing or a retirement community. Um, she continually tells me that she is not, quote, ready for assisted living at 66 years old mm -hmm. and um, that the medical professionals don't know what they are talking about. Of course. Um, right. <laughs> so out of everyone in this situation, which in involves just her herself right now because she, her um, husband, she has a late husband, um, her sister, uh, which is who is 55 and her brother, who is 57. Um, she's the oldest of three. And then myself. So out of everyone in, involved, I seem to be the one impacted most negatively from this manipulation. How come? Um, why are you the, why are you the most negatively impacted? Mostly because I'm her primary caretaker. Okay. Um, you have medical power she, of attorney. I do. I have medical and, and, uh, durable. Okay. Are you um, on the advanced which, directive? Do you get to make those well, so that's that's been an issue this past summer is they are trying to contest that, saying that she signed the power of attorney um, incompetent. So um, as of right now, it's on hold. Yes, I, I am capable of writing checks to her in-home nurse, okay. but that has been a who's, court issue. Who's contesting this? Her her siblings? Her, her siblings, oh, correct. Gosh. So they're saying that she was cognitively impaired when she signed her directives and they're taking you correct. to court over that? Correct. And why are they? Did, did she have a big estate? Why are they? Or they don't no, want her in home. Like what? What are they tr trying to fight you for? Well, so so that's what we're trying to understand is that we believe we have uh, reason to believe through text messages and phone call conversations that they are in denial about her state. Mm -hmm. um, they don't. They also agree with her that she's not. You know, quote unquote. She keeps using the word "ready" for assisted living, um, and so we don't have the answer for that right now, but that is the million dollar question. Okay. Um, but my question, my, my question for you mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, she does use this manipulation and, and they are feeding her what she wants to hear. Why you do you know, think, why do you ready. think, why do you, so if she's neurologically impaired, if she's got early stage dementia, if she's got Alzheimer's, if she continues to have, um, strokes, She's got legitimate physiological, neurological damage. Mm -hmm. And so 
it may be what, what makes you think she is manipulating you versus she's really struggling with some sort of, um, for lack of better terms, this isn't really medically accurate, but she's got some sort of traumatic brain injury. Um, mm-hmm. And she's being handed a script by people that she's known for 50 years and she's following that script. What makes you think that she is, n- you're saying two different things. One, she is using this as a tool for manipulation and she also cannot make decisions on her own cognitively and she needs to be put in a home. So which one of those is it? Because it feels like you're splitting right. the, the difference there. Yeah, so so the things that have happened that make us, um, I say us, my husband, I believe that she may be using this manipulation is, um, so all summer long I took her around and toured assisted living facilities so mm-hmm. that uh, we could be prepared for this. Um, she then um, tells friends and family that, my daughter is putting me in a home without giving proper context to the entire situation. So, um, so listen, let's, let's, let's let that go. This is a 65, 60, how old is she? 65? 60, 66. 66 year old woman who is feeling her mind and her body slowly leave her. And from the folks that I've had an opportunity to talk to who are in this early stage, it's one of the most horrifying, terrifying feelings to, to feel your body leaving you. And so, yes, they're going to couch stories because any admission like I need help is going to sound like a weakness, a brokenness. And so it's much easier to pawn it off on somebody. Does that hurt being her daughter? Oh, my gosh, yes. But I would cycle out of the blame. And the reality is you are. You are putting her in a home and she is saying, I don't want this. And you're saying, no, we're going to do this. So her, her action, her, her words are technically true. And I would have you just let go of the, you need to tell the full story in the context. Like you're watching, you're in a very hard season where you're watching the woman who raised you slowly lose herself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I guess to add to that too, um, it's not just that she's saying my daughter's forcing me into a home. I, I really have been keen to her wishes and her will. And we have open conversations about her will, which is why I think sometimes she's in tune and knows what's going on. And then sometimes she uses it to say, I forget, I don't remember. Um, so the language that she uses with her friends and the family members, like her siblings are my, do- my daughter forcing me into a sister living, isn't accurate to what we discussed. Um, and so I followed her wishes. I didn't, we, we didn't, even though we toured assisted livings and we didn't follow through with that, I then asked if she was okay with in-home care, a nurse to come. She said, sure. So I hired an in-home nurse and then she went behind my back to a lawyer and told her, the lawyer, that I wasn't putting her in assisted living according to her discharge papers, but instead I was hiring a nurse at home. Um, I, I, so and as it, but, but listen, listen, you're talking to someone with some major cognitive challenges. She's not, she's not fully, she's not, she's not neurotypical anymore. She's struggling. And certain days she's going to remember certain things in different ways. Right. And so what you're doing is you're trying to hold a character issue over a physiological challenge. And I tell you, that's causing you a ton of unnecessary heartache. When you love somebody and you're in charge of the care of somebody who is an early stage dementia or who's a multiple stroke sufferer, it's heartbreaking. It's brutal. Mm-hmm. It's awful. And you're experiencing this. It affects your marriage. It affects your kids. It affects everybody. And then when you're in this super unfortunate situation where her brothers and sisters decide to go to war too for who knows what reasons, or let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They're getting these heartbreaking texts from their sister saying, my daughter's forcing me into this or what your situation, unfortunately is all too not, I mean, all too common. And that doesn't mean it's not right. But what you're going to have to do is love your mom and through these moments because she's just not thinking linearly like you and I do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah, it's it's hard. You're you're trying to fix a moral or character issue, and that's not a moral character issue to fix. Mm -hmm. And I think your heartbreak in this situation and your grief over watching your mom slowly unspool is causing you to double down on something very similar to how she's trying to double down on something. Mm-hmm. She, she's losing something, so she's going to blame you. 
And then y'all are going to come to this great agreement. The next day she's going to wake up. Her body's going to be feeling different. She's going to have different thoughts, different memory patterns. And then she's going to call somebody else that she knows and trusts and says, my daughter's doing this to me because she's scared and she's Mm -hmm. terrified. And Mm -hmm. you're Mm -hmm. in a very similar situation where y'all agree on something. She calls and gets a lawyer and then you get mad at her. And it's kind of like (laughs) you have young kids. I'm actually currently six months pregnant and have an 18-month-old. There you go. Okay, so um, I don't want to compare. This wouldn't be fair. People are going to write mean things about me on the internet. But um, the closest the closest thing I can tell you is your eight month, 18-month-old may do some things that you would think, why did you just barf on me? You know what I mean? It's gross, and you wish they wouldn't do that, but it's not a moral or character issue. And so you handle it differently. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And so are you holding – medical paper saying that she is, um, that she is struggling cognitively. Has she been diagnosed with dementia, with Alzheimer's? Not, not quite. We're in that evaluation process right now. The the papers that I have say that she needs assistance. These are from the discharge after the stroke that she needs assistance with finances and she needs assistance with, she's not allowed to drive. She needs assistance with, um, anytime she needs transportation. So what's made you think that she needs assisted medical care as well? Um, I've known my mom for a really long time. I've seen the decline happen. I've seen her kind of wobbling around. So the first stroke left her physically impaired. The second one has left her, uh, cognitively impaired. So I and, want, I want you to get with a medical doctor and say, and, and also, and also medical professionals have said, if it, I said off record, if this is your mother, what would she do? Because she does live alone. She is by herself. Um, they said, probably some type of facility would be better than in-home nursing. But again, she was resistant to that. So that's why we landed with the in-home nursing care for now. And so we can find the long-term solution. And what I would tell you is you are passed off the record. You need on the record because your mom's trying to fight you legally. Your aunts and uncles are trying to fight you legally. You can't do off the record anymore. Mm -hmm. And so you need to get these things in writing and that's the medical coverage you need. Because you've got the medical power of attorney, you just need the medical professionals to give you their professional opinion, which is she needs elevated care that you can't provide, that can't be provided in home. And Mm -hmm. it will be one of the, if not the most heartbreaking seasons of your life because your mom will scream. She may cry. She may send you messages saying, why do you hate me? Why are you Mm -hmm. taking me out of my home? Why don't you'll have aunts and uncles will turn on you. And that's when you have to have a group of people in your life that you can turn to that aren't them that Mm -hmm. will hold your arms up because this one's going to be hard. So this is my question for you. Am I morally obligated to work to maintain a relationship with her and her siblings while they all align with each other and are trying to be combative with me? Her, yes. Her, yes. But that relationship's going to look different. It is not going to be the friendship that y'all have had. It's not going to be the, um, hey, mom, what do you think about this? It's going to be you in some ways becoming the parent here. And in the same way that your 18-month-old doesn't get a vote on things, it's going to flip that way. That's why your mom, when she was um, – um, when she was in her right mind, if you will, um, which is an ugly way to say that, but when she was in her right mind – she chose you so that when these things happen, I've got somebody I trust, come what may. And what's coming is her brothers and sisters are going to war with you. She's going to war mm-hmm. with you, not intentionally, but she is. And so, yeah, you got to maintain a relationship with her. And sometimes that's going to be you show up to see her once a week and she's going to say, I don't want to see your face. And it's mm-hmm. going to break your heart and you're going to weep and you're going to have to have somebody you can go to and talk to. And, um, but also, you're still going to write her a letter every week telling her how great she is. And you're going to do the best you can to let your grandkids be there. And her brother and sister are just getting notes from her saying, help me, my daughter's crazy. Mm -hmm. And so as as hard as they're going to fight you, know that they're trying to fight you on behalf of your mom too. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's brutal. You I don't do agree not, with it, but I don't. That's right, that's right. <laughs> and if, if, if you told me there was a multi-million dollar estate and they mm-hmm. were getting ready to go to war over that, that sucks, right? Yeah. I'm going to choose to say that, to suggest that they are just getting these raw messages from somebody that they love 
who's been a, basically a mother figure to them, right? She's old enough. She's a decade older than them. So she mm-hmm. probably had a maternal uh, figure, was played a maternal role in their life. And they're saying, oh my gosh, crazy, crazy, crazy pregnant daughter has just gone nuts, right? And right, that's you. Right, right, um, She just right. wants mom's money or she just doesn't want to deal with this anymore. And, <laughs> and all those evil, mean things, you do not have to keep a uh, relationship with them. In fact, I wouldn't recommend it. You may want to write them a letter and say, I love them. I'm holding doctor's notes. And it may be, if you got real lucky, that a social worker, sometimes these situations assign social workers, and I would ask for one, can sit down and do a family meeting that would include you, your husband, um, her brothers and sisters, whoever got invited, and that the social worker can walk through, or maybe a neurologist can walk everybody through, here's what's happening in mom's head. Here's what's happening in her mind. Here's why she might send you these text messages that are going to sound so heartfelt and so accurate, and they're completely inaccurate. She's just terrified and scared. Over and over. So it may be that you can set that up, and that would be remarkable. That's probably a long shot. Probably not going to happen. And so anybody I've ever met, and this is in my family too, who have dealt with somebody with Alzheimer's, with early-stage dementia, with strokes with those type of mobility challenges is heartbreaking but always go back to two things number one do what the doctors say if they say you need medical care then you need medical care and number two they chose you for a reason they chose you for a reason so that when decisions got real hard ugh, you would make them you'd make the right ones I hate this for you Alexis I know this is hard this is going to be a long season for you it's going to be a long season years okay Keep showing up, keep showing up, keep showing up. You're awesome, Alexis. We'll be right back on Dr. John Deloney's show. The world has become more and more chaotic and uncertain and loud. And it seems that everyone has anxiety. I've been there and so have you. It's why I wrote this small, direct, and personal book called Redefining Anxiety. In this book, I discuss what anxiety is, what it's not, and how you can get back on the road of being whole and well. Listen, you are not broken, and I'm living proof that you can get your life back. I wrote this book so everyone could read it, not just science nerds like me and my friends, and I priced it at 10 bucks so that everyone can afford it. This little book landed on the bestseller list and is now being purchased by the case and given away in counseling offices, universities, churches, and homes across the country. I don't care if you're a teenager or an executive or a 75-year-old grandmother, this book is for everyone. So go to johndeloney.com and get your copy of Redefining Anxiety today. All right, we are back. Let's go to Marie in Pennsylvania. Hey, Marie, what's up? Hi, Dr. John. How are you? We are rocking and rolling. How about you? I'm hanging in there. Oh, goodness gracious. What's going on? Um, I'm going to struggle through this, so please take, bear with me. Take your time. Take your time. Um, my 16 year old daughter, um, was taken and admitted to the hospital on Sunday due Mm. to a suicide attempt. Wow, Marie, I'm so sorry. (laughs) Um, uh, while she's been in the hospital, um, she was in direct extended contact with someone that was a COVID positive staff member, Mm. which has now caused her hospital stay to be much longer than the normal stay prior to going to a inpatient mental health program. Is it because she's been quarantined? Um, they haven't necessarily quarantined her. Um, like I'm able to stay with her all day. Um, they're, they just need a negative test after 10 days of the exposure for the facilities to be willing to take her. Oh, okay. So because, she because she of, hasn't, t- because she was in ahead. contact. Correct. Okay. Um, like at, at the hospital, they have like a one-on-one nurse with her all the time. Okay. Um, and that from Sunday night to Monday morning, a 12-hour shift, that nurse tested positive on Monday morning. And she had spent 12 hours with my daughter okay. the, right prior. Has your daughter um, had any so symptoms they, or anything? Is she sick? No. Okay. No. Good deal. Good deal. No. So can we, do, um, can we do one thing real quick? Sure. I want you to hold your, take as deep a breath as you can and hold it. One, two, three, and then let it out slow. 
really hard. I know. But Marie, she's going to be in there for 10 days and we're going to let that one go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you got a Mm -hmm. lot in your heart and head right now and you're going to war over Mm -hmm. something you can't change. So we're going to let that be. She's going to be there for 10 days. She's going to be surrounded by people who love her and care for her. She's going to get food. Mm -hmm. She's going to get sleep, Mm -hmm. which are two critical Mm -hmm. things right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. we're going to let that one go. Yes. Cool. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. So she's there for 10 days. Great. Yeah. What's next? Um, because of this extended stay, mm-hmm. it has allowed me the opportunity to start researching these facilities. Oh, no. Terrifying. Did you look online reviews? Mm-hmm. <laughs> All of them. Marie, don't All look at them. the online reviews. I wish somebody would have told me that two days ago. Don't look at online reviews of psychiatric care. Don't ever do that. Never, never, never. Oh, no. I'm so sorry that you did that. Okay, so has the hospital recommended places for you? Yes. And you checked them out, and they were miserable and evil and awful and all that stuff? Every review says don't dare send your child there. Of course, of course. Um, That's a whole show. That is a whole show. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and I understand, I mean, any any information you get from people online, you're getting information. People leave reviews when they're angry. I understand that. It, very few people, um, I have had the, the, the mm-hmm. honor of sitting with a number of parents who are pulling their kids out of these situations. Mm-hmm. Often there is such deep and pro- like what you're experiencing right now, such deep and profound confusion and Mm -hmm. grief and loss Mm -hmm. and mourning that it is anybody I could possibly pin this on, please. Mm -hmm. And psychiatric care facilities are really hard and they range from somebody who's 14 who says the words, I'm having dark thoughts and gets caught Mm -hmm. up in a school system that dumps them into a psychiatric care unit and somebody who is acutely schizophrenic who has tried to kill themselves multiple times and they're all in the same room. So Mm -hmm. it can be terrifying and scary and all those things. And then you get a parent or a mom who's got their own challenge and then they go, they've got an opportunity to put it on the internet, right? So I would tell Mm -hmm. you to not get on those reviews, okay? And I know Mm -hmm. that's so hard because you're just looking for the best info you got. It's so hard. And these are Mm -hmm. expensive and people get their kid out and they're so grateful and then they get this bill and you get angry there, right? Mm -hmm. So all I have to say is there's not a lot of... um, there's not a lot of incentive for people to put positive reviews. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, let's back out for a second. Okay. Tell me about your daughter. She not been doing well. Does I this love surprise her you? So much. I know you do. I, would... I know you do. Um, she has struggled with um anxiety, um, being anxious and struggled with depression for years. Okay. Um, we have had her in counseling. Um, she's been seeing a great counselor for, uh, 10 years. Um, off and on, I mean, not every week, not, we go through peaks and valleys sure. where we will see, um, her counselor weekly for two or three months and then we'll go six or eight months and, not really have a need and then something will come up and we'll go back to weekly for a little bit what's it what was her um, childhood like 10 years with the same challenges like mm-hmm. that lets me know what did she come from a rough environment does she have some challenges that she experienced early on um, what, what's home life um dad and i divorced okay. 10 about 10 years ago okay. um and that's kind of when all these things peaked okay. um was there, was, was there some challenges before the divorce um, I mean, between me and her dad, of course. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Was it? Was there some but, stuff that? She, okay, she was living in that water. Is what I'm saying. She was breathing that air. Is a better way to say it. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um. So yeah. now we fast forward, and again, that's not for blame. That's just for, I'm trying to get some context here. Mm-hmm. And then what mm-hmm. happened? Did something? Did something acute happen? Was there a trigger moment here, or did she just get exhausted and say, I, "I'm tired." Um, I, I think it's the past two years, mm-hmm. just the chaos, the losing touch with friends. Um, yeah. I think that, um, she, she's had, um, a serious boyfriend and her and the boyfriend have been teenage boyfriend, girlfriend arguing lately. 
Um, <laughs> and I mean, that, that has contributed to some of her anxiety, mm-hmm. but I, I, I really think that it's just the past two years of everyone's world being chaotic and, She's been at home doing cyber school and not having good contact with teachers. And she did not um, succeed in her freshman year of high school. She had to repeat her freshman year because of the online chaos that she just, I mean, she just, she didn't, she didn't succeed at that. Okay. And how did she Um, try to take her life? Pills. Okay. And she took 12 Tylenol PMs. Okay. And did she leave a note? No. Okay. Her dad found her. Okay. Um, did he know to find her? Did she send something out on social media? Um, he found her in the bathroom. Okay. And she was um, from, I, I was not at the house. Of course, she was at her dad's house. Mm-hmm. And um, from what I understand, he heard her crying in the bathroom. And he opened the door and she was sitting on the floor and her extremities were beginning to turn blue. Yeah. And he called 911. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. I'm glad he was there. Me too. I'm glad. Me too. So now she's in a hospital with Mm -hmm. round the clock care. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Have they, have they stabilized her? She said, I wish, um, I can't believe this happened. I'm so glad to see you. Like what's her state right now? Um, she is, she wants me there with her all the time. Mm -hmm. She doesn't like when I leave. Um, she has not talked to me about, the what's or the why's or the house. Okay. I haven't pushed. I haven't really asked. I don't, I, I don't know if I should. Okay. Um, she wants to come home. Yeah. Um, but she, she does say that she wants help. She wants to get better. Good. She wants, um, to learn how to handle stress better. Like she knows she needs the tools. She, she, she says that. Awesome. And she's willing to go to an inpatient facility. Okay. Um, but she can tell that I'm anxious about it. Yeah. So I think that makes her anxious about it. Gotcha. So you nailed it just there. She will absorb you. And that's Mm -hmm. a lot of pressure on mom. And Mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's what we sign up for when we become parents. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she's going to Mm -hmm. absorb dad too. Mm -hmm. Are you and dad on speaking terms? Are you all co-parents here? Okay. Yes. Um, If possible at all, and if y'all are both married to other people now, um, it may be good mm-hmm. to bring them in too. But a, what I would call an emergency, not an emergency like there's lights flashing, but soon, this week, next mm-hmm. week, I think it would be worth your time to go get with a local pastor or a local counselor, somebody you could get in a room with and say, here's how we're all going to walk forward. Because mm-hmm. what your daughter's going to need is a united front of people who love her and are going to hold her accountable and give her boundaries Kids crave boundaries, and the in the thing that's most um, that usually happens here is everyone pulls all the boundaries off because they don't want to say or do the wrong thing because they think this like I don't want to be the one who fill in the blank right, and mm-hmm. kids are desperate for them. Please mm-hmm. give me guardrails, right? Yeah. And but those guardrails can get oppressive in Looney Tune also, and so it's just getting mm-hmm. everybody in a room. No blame. This is all about how are we going to love her moving forward, and it might be. We're not going to say, I can't believe you did that. We're going to have to, none of that, right? And so getting with a counselor Mm -hmm. can say, here's five or 10 things we're all going to agree on. And Mm -hmm. dad, you're going to write a letter every week. Mom, you're going to write one every day or fill in the blank, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But getting in a room, if y'all can do that and act like grownups here and your daughter's desperate for that, then Mm -hmm. everybody walks out with a united front, okay? Okay. Um, The second is, yes, she wants you there every time uh, as much as possible, and mm-hmm. be there as much as you can. But if you got to go to work, you got to go to work. And okay. having somebody there who loves her, whether that's your, I don't know if you're remarried or if you've got other siblings mm-hmm. or an aunt or an uncle or some, a mentor, or some, people can be there. That's great. If they can't, they can't. What would be really cool in these moments is to have a flood of people who love her write her letters and just say, we miss you and we love you. And here's okay. why that's so important. She's sitting in a hospital feeling like she's alone and she's just got some nurse mm-hmm. sitting there on her phone. Um, or reading a book or whatever, having mm-hmm. something that she can hold tangibly that when she starts thinking, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I don't have this, I don't believe, she's got evidence on top of evidence on top of evidence that that's not true. Yeah. And there will be a little bit of embarrassment and shame, like I can't believe I'm so embarrassed, but all of that will be will, will be washed away by the onslaught of, 
handheld letters. And so I don't know if you've got a resource or a connection or um, what her situation is at school, whether teachers or students can write letters or things like that, but those become worth their weight in gold um, for okay. somebody holding into their heart. Um, and then here's what I would do if I'm you. So I'm just thinking, fast forwarding, I'm in your situation. I got two young kids. I get the same call and I race over to the hospital and they tell me that we've, did they give her charcoal and pump her stomach and all that? No, they did not. They just did blood work and tested and waited till her Tylenol levels came down. Oh, okay. So they just let that one ride, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And that, <laughs> that's a scary yeah. one. I had a, my son yeah. ate a handful of Tylenol and they said, we'll know if his liver stops. And that's a scary, yeah. scary moment, right? Yeah. That's one of the scariest yeah. moments of my life was waiting for that test. Um, he just, they look like candy and my son popped mm -hmm. a bunch and they said, we'll know if his liver stops. That's about the best we can do. Yeah. And uh, whew, yeah, I remember that. Um, so I would get on the phone with the school counselor. Have you okay. talked to her or him? I, I have, yeah. Okay. They should have a mm -hmm. resource that they trust. And okay. that's, that's where if you can get a insurance referral and you can go through there, that's where I would go because they okay. will have looped with untold numbers of students and their parents in this very same situation that nobody knows about. Um, mm -hmm. Students disappear and they come back two weeks later and they're integrated back into school. But that would be the person I would go to in my local community if I was in the same same situation you're in. Okay. And okay. They should, they'll probably give I you two or that. three and go in mm -hmm. and visit with them and go with your gut. Okay. Your mom, okay. you know. And mm -hmm. if you start feeling anxious, whew, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you struggle with anxiety? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> so, Marie, you're worth the work, too. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. serious. I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm not currently in trouble. You, I'm okay. You're not. Mm-hmm. You're not. My you, baby is. I know, but so is Marie. Mm -hmm. So is Marie. Okay. Am I right? Uh, yeah. I've done this yeah. too long, Marie. I promise you. You're worth the work too. And when you can, then everybody can breathe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Will you call somebody today? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For you? I, I did yesterday. I, I, I did. I did yesterday. I, I, I made a phone call yesterday and yeah, you I'm. You promise? I Yes, absolutely. I did. Okay. Yes, I promise. Will you actually yeah. go through with it? Because you're going to get really yeah. anxious or you're going to go once and you're going to be done. Will you please go? I will. Yes, sir. I will. Okay. My heart's with you, Marie. I appreciate it. Thank you. Do you have people you can sit with? And now I made it weird and you're trying to get off the phone. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> I know um, I did. Yeah, I, I, okay. Yeah. Breathe. It's, it's, it sucks. It's un, uh, unimaginable if you haven't been sitting in this situation. How did we get here, right? The emotions are really weird. You get really angry mm -hmm. and then you get really sad. Yeah. And I love her so much, but I'm so mad at her mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm, it's hard. And then you feel guilty and you're a crappy mom because mm -hmm. you're mad at your daughter and you're not. It's okay to be mad. It's okay to be raged out. It's okay to be pissed off. It's okay to regret the last 10. All those feelings and things are real. They're not truthful, but they're real. And do you, can you tell mm -hmm. the difference there? Yes. Yes. So feel yes. them and have somebody you can say them out loud to. Write them down. Okay. I'm so pissed off at you. How dare mm -hmm. you try to take the most precious thing in the world from me? How dare you do mm -hmm. that? How dare you ex-husband fill in the blank of all that fun stuff you could just pile on that, you know, you could dump in that yeah. hole, right? All of it. Yeah. It's real. It's not all true, but it's real. Yeah. And you, or I can tell you right now, Marie, you don't believe you're worth fixing right now. And fixing's a bad thing. You don't feel like you're worth healing right now because your baby's in the hospital. And what I'm telling you is you got to eat and you got to sleep and you got to have oxygen too. And you've heard that being said over and over and over again, that you got to put your oxygen mask on first. And it is never more true than right now. Okay. I hear you. You promise? I'm only telling yes, you, I love you. I, I'm telling I you right now. And you I know. I'm trying. 
I know you are. It's, isn't a, it's not a try. It's not like work harder, do harder. I'm not trying to be Jocko here, right? I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to tell you. <sighs> mm -hmm. I came home last night and ate a bag of beef jerky and drank a bottle of wine in the bubble bath. So I think that was good for me. <laughs> hey, you get one of those and you already burned it, yeah. but you get one, right? <laughs> yeah. And you probably woke up this morning <laughs> with the greatest <laughs> gas of all time. Is that fair? <laughs> It's yeah, it's a, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I've got uh, still got uh, I still don't smell well after COVID, and <laughs> I, I'm even I'm glad I'm not in the Pennsylvania area. But listen, you got you get you get one or two of those. But I want to make sure you got someone you can call and say I'm really pissed yeah. off right now, and they're not going to say well you shouldn't be. They're going to say I know I hate that for you. It sucks. Come over. I do. I I, I do. I, I have some, I have some good friends, and good. I've been in contact with them. And yes, I've good. yes. If the school counselor gives you nothing, go with the resources that the hospital is going to get you. Those are your only choices, okay? okay. Follow your gut. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be hard. Your daughter's going to text you and say, I wish I wasn't here. The, some mm -hmm. of that stuff is part of the entry of this deal, right? Healing okay. from this is going to be hard. Lots of shame, lots of embarrassment, lots of people that have some major psychiatric disorders in patient care with her going, whoa, I'm not here, right? And mm -hmm. I've had some experiences where that was the greatest thing ever for a young person. Like, whoa, I've got a lot different situation than some of these folks here. Okay? Okay. Um, and it will be hard. Trust the doctors here. And I know that's going to be the hardest thing in the world. Got it? Yeah, got it. Marie, we are all 100% behind you. Let us know how the next few days go. Let us know if she gets into a hospital. And we will be rooting for you, rooting for you, rooting for you. Thank you so, so much for that call. Every parent out there, when your kid gets sick, when something's going wrong, when your kid's in the hospital, everything in our body says, let's dump 125% of who we are into that situation. And what I want to tell you is you got to stop and back out because you got to be okay. As my baby, forget all that. I'm telling you right now, I've been to too many hospitals with too many parents and sat for too long in these situations. You got to eat. You got to breathe. You got to check in with people that you love. You got to sleep. You got to be clear headed and listen to doctors. You got to write things down. You got to have friends that you can call and weep bitterly with and say, I hate everything and I'm pissed off about everything and I'm angry about everything. And I miss my baby and I love her all in the same sentence. And they're not going to think you're crazy. You got to have all of that stuff. And you got to do the hardest thing in the world, which is trust right now. Experts, you got to trust the doctors, you got to trust the people that. Oh, it's hard, 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 Marie, hard, Marie. But your daughter's going to be okay. She's going to come out and go, I want to heal. I want to be better. And you're going to have a group of people rally around you. Thank you so, so much for being honest and vulnerable, Marie. Thank you so much for this call. Whew. All right. So as we wrap up today's show, Kelly came in here at the break. This is one of your favorites of all time. It is. I don't know why. It's just, it's a feel good, happy song. And this show needs to end with a feel-good, happy song. We need that, song. yes. So this one is off the 1980 album. Um, Kelly was already 17 when this one came out, right? Is that fair? Seriously? I'm sorry, that was rude. You were not born yet. You weren't even thought of yet. Well, I was born. I'm trying to pick one. I know, I was six. See me not making a joke there? That was so hard. Like four just buzzed through my head. I'm proud of you. But they didn't come out of my mouth. That's so, good. You've matured. <laughs> right in front of our eyes. Um, 1980 record, One Trick Pony, the extraordinary Paul Simon writes this song called Late in the Evening, and it goes like this. First thing I remember, I was lying in my bed, and I couldn't have been no more than one or two, and I remember there was a radio coming from the room next door, and my mother laughed the way some ladies do, and Kelly, when it's late in the evening and the music's seeping through. The next thing I remember, I'm walking down the street. I'm feeling all right. I'm with my boys. I'm with my troops. Yeah. And down along the avenue, some guys were shooting pool. And I heard the sound of acapella groups. Yeah. Singing late in the evenings. All the girls out on the stoops. Yeah. Late in the evening right here on the Dr. John Deloney Show. Yeah. 